respected colleagues, I'm deeply honored and I have to advise you that one very, very famous professor is among us, Professor Elsa Binhold, and I'm somehow ashamed that she's participating this workshop, which actually is a workshop for the brain. I want to make you think about how biological procedures work and I wanted to present you the results. But once you have listened to her lecture tomorrow morning, and once you will be able to see her publications on the ultrastructural level of bone regeneration, you don't need any workshops more to understand and to see with your own eyes how bone regeneration works. Because there are a lot of fairy tales around how bone regeneration works. And I'm very grateful to Professor Andriana this morning, who stated clearly, absolutely clearly, that bone regeneration derives from the periosteum. And this is the vital point in all the issues. What I'm going to present to you is a study that we recently finished, which is now submitted for publication. And the background to this study is explained in very short words. I'm working as maxillofacial surgeon since 1988. We started with synthetic bone grafts instead of autologous bone at the University Clinic in Vienna back in 1988 with Calcitech, which was a pure hydroxyapatite, full non-microporous particle. The results have been extraordinary. The bone, or what is called bone, what is, was the result of the regeneration? It was so hard that even implant, implant drills broke when you wanted to insert an implant in this compound of natural bone and um, calcitech. Now, with the time, synthetic bone grafts got accepted worldwide. And then, of course, we started with BIOS. Then we changed over a very short period to Cerasorb. Then we changed over to Nanobone. And then finally, 2007, our research group has been introduced to the products of degradable solutions. And since our protocol in our research group for implant placement is that we always take the torque, uh, the drill torque value and the insertion torque value as a kind of reference for the primary stability of the implant, which is now proven to be the most important parameter. We just looked up our files and we were checking and we found out that there are huge difference in insertion torque values between different bone graft materials. So what did we do? Let's start with the introduction. How do biomaterials and implants also integrate exactly. And this is one of the most important points that we have to understand. Whatever we put inside a scaffold, whatever we use to create a scaffold, first of all, it's always an also integration. It doesn't matter if it's a peak, um, um, a peak material, which is brand new and which has a very, very big future, also in dentistry, because it had a big future already in orthopedic surgery for the last 20 years. If it's hydroxyapatite, if it's beta tricalcium phosphate, if it's titanium, whatever you put inside the bone and that is biologically accepted by the evolution, by the biology of the human body, will get first of all also integrated. Let's take a look how this works. This is a short video I copied it from, uh, from uh, Mobile BioCare. It's a teaching video concerning also integration of implants. So what you will see first is how bone regenerates around implants <coughs> and biomaterials. It's shown an implant, but of course this is also valid for uh, biomaterials that you insert. First of all, and this is once again, I think uh, Professor Andrea, for this morning, Andreana, this morning, there is no atraumatic implant insertion. As you can see, it's highly traumatic. You are disrupting the calcified structures, you're disrupting blood vessels. But actually, if you take a deep breath and you take a look back, how, what happens during a simple fracture of your bone when you have an accident, it's exactly the same. In this case, an implant is inserted. So, First of all, you have the trauma to the bone. And the human body reacts to every trauma in a very uniform way. It's causing a inflammation. In this case, it's a positive inflammation. 
First of all, you have the aggregation of the thrombocytes. So this is another big issue in the future. We were dealing with platelet-rich plasma. We were dealing uh, with uh, bone growth enhancing blood plasma factors. But the basic principle is always the same. First, you have the agglutination of the thrombocytes. They start to build up a net of fibrin, the fibrin net, which then contracts. You can see here the fibrin is just growing out. It's starting to build up a net structure around the surface, the titanium surface of an implant, the sarcomial surface of an implant, the peak surface of an implant, <coughs> and of course, around your dog's appetite. Whatever you put inside the bone, first of all, you need bleeding. First of all, for the human body to regenerate, you of course will need vascularization. And this is initiated by the primary step in every simple bone healing fracture site. So, once the fibrin net is built up, then you have the settlement of leukocytes. And uh, with the time, there will be then the sprouting of collagenous fibers. Here you have macrophages that start to eat up the first step of the healing procedure, of the, the first step of the healing cascade. It's resolving the fibrin net, and then it's starting to build up the collagenous fiber texture. And this is also something we have to keep in mind. We always see bone as a mineral part of the body. But if you build a big bridge that has to carry a, a high, very high load, of course, you need the, uh, the metal structures inside, the steel structures that endure the tension. The calcification gives only static uh, endurability to the bone. So in the second step, we are starting now with a settlement um, of uh, collagenous building uh, cells that just get into the porous surface structure of bone graft material and of um, titanium or zirconia. So this is why we need um, the microporous structure. And with the time, there will be the osteoblasts that are starting to create, beside the collagenous fiber texture, the ossification around the foreign body. And when we speak about bone augmentation, it's always funny to hear that we insert implants. But everybody says, yeah, I need autologous bone because I don't <coughs> want to have a foreign body in the implant side. I mean, the implant is a foreign body. And this is how every single trauma to bone proceeds when it is healing. This is very important. And this is why in Austria we had a big fight until about six, seven years ago where there was the fraction of the autologous bone religion, the fraction of the synthetic bone religion, but nobody really understood that the basic principle of whatever we put in, into an augmentation site is always an osseointegration, integration, even if we use autologous bone. So, what is the basic biological question? What is the difference between natural teeth and implants and biomaterials exactly? Well, this answer is very, very simple. When we have a natural tooth, we have the periodontal ligament, which is rested in the alveolar bone and connects the tooth uh, to the alveolar bone. And we have a crown length and we have a root length. So, next step. When we compare this with a dental implant, what are we missing? We have no periodontal ligament. And when we exert pressure, and this is the basic principle of orthodontics, when we exert continuous certain pressure to the tooth, then of course we have a pressure site on the bone which leads to bone resorption. On the other hand, by the periodontal ligament, we have a pulling force on the bone that causes a positional bone growth. This is why we can move teeth, very simple. And once you do a little bit of thinking about basic physics, you know how orthodontic works. Contrary to this, Unfortunately, when we take a dental implant and you exert lateral forces to the implant, we only have pressure zones around the implant side. So that means, since the force always is up here and the implant is resting here in the bone, we have 
very peak pressure forces here, and by the top <coughs> moment we have peak pressure forces here. So of course, uh, we are speaking now about short implants, but there is one very basic simple law. If you overload any structure that you insert into the bone, and this is also valid uh, for teeth, if you do too aggressive orthodontic treatment, what are you going to have? You're going to have vertical bone resorption and you have resorption of the root. And if you do it too aggressive, then you will end up with no bone and with uh, teeth where the entire root was completely resorbed. So we have to live with biology and we can't work against it. So overload of implant results in bone resorption. And the bone resorbs, this is an average value, when you exert forces more than 7.5 kilograms per square centimeters. So this is the basic difference between an implant and uh, a natural tooth. You will ask yourself now why is he speaking about uh, implants and the differences. It's very simple because I'm an old-fashioned implantologist and until now I still prefer to have longer implants inside um, the implant site instead of short implants. Because with long implants I have very good experience since 1988. With short implants I don't know until now. Okay, so this should be clear now what the basic difference between an implant and the natural tooth is. So, what prevents proper osseointegration of implants and prior materials exactly? And this is maybe the most important topic of today and of all our workings as oral surgeon implantologists because there is one principle that we have to keep in mind. As I told you before, the physiology of bone healing is very uniform in the entire body. And the body doesn't care if there are orthopedists or if there are oral surgeons. Um, bone is bone, and bone is formed according to the necessity of loading. So this is why in the jaws we have woven bone structures, and in the long bones we have a specialized structure of the long bones. But the physiology is always the same. So once you set a trauma, this could be an accident, a fracture, this could be a tooth extraction. <coughs> Even if you do it minimally invasive, it's still traumatic, and the body doesn't care that it was a tooth extraction. The healing will always follow the normal routine of bone fracture healing. So first you have the hematoma formation, then you have the fibrocartilaginous callus formation, then you have the bony callus formation, and at the end, once you are satisfied with the primary bone healing, you have the constant remodeling. And this is the most important part that we have to understand is that bone remodels <coughs> lifelong. The bones you were born with are changed between seven and 10 years. You will have completely new bones. If you don't move and if you don't load your bones and your muscles, they will get atrophic. And we have a very modern word for this, osteoporosis. Once you go to the International Space Station out there and live for six months and you come back to the Earth, you will not be able to walk anymore. You have no muscles left and you have no calcified bone left. Because evolution made it like this. An organ that you don't use, it gets atrophic. And when you read the daily newspapers, you might think there are a lot of people that, use, that don't use their brains. Well, it's also valid for the brains. So what is the um, big issue on this? The general medical knowledge, a modern bone fracture does not heal and it, in, and it results in pseudotrosis. Because if you don't immobilize a fracture or a traumatized bone, it will never heal. We know this. I mean, if you don't put a cast after fracture, it won't heal. If we don't keep the augmentation site immobilized, it won't heal. Or it won't heal in the way we will receive a nice socket or we will receive a nice um, alveolar grain to insert implants in. So this is a very, very big issue. And this was published uh, by Mamoto back in 2009. <coughs> Very, very interesting paper. You should read it, although it's a little bit difficult to read. But what she proved beyond any doubt 
that it is known that there is a functional cross antagonism between transcription factors that controls tissue morphogenesis and that responds to both mechanical and chemical clues. Which means, mechanical clues means, if you don't immobilize, the result of the augmentation, the result of the healing, will be less compared to a situation when you fully immobilize an augmentation site. This is, let's say, one of the core publications that led me to the full understanding of how bone regeneration, everything that we do in maxillofacial surgery or in oral surgery, we do. Okay, let's take another example. This is more common and more understandable to us. Although it is already known by orthopedic surgeons since more than 20, 25, 30 years. If you insert an implant or a biomaterial, it can only also integrate properly when fully immobilized. So, if you have an unstable fixation, that means you insert the implant in a drilled implant socket that is too wide for the diameter of the implant. Let's make believe you took the wrong drill. Or you took the right drill, but you found out you don't have the implant in the right diameter. You just plug it in. But if you don't keep the implant fully immobilized, it will never also integrate. And this is very well known, and this is even a bigger problem in orthopedic surgery. Only if the implant is immobilized, you will have bone in growth and a stable fixation. So, what does this lead to? The more force you need to insert an implant, the more strength you need if you use a hand wrench, or if you use an implant motor and you insert the implant and you just adjust the torque on the implant motor, the higher the strength for implant insertion, the better the immobilization, and the better are the chances for a full osseointegration integration of the implant, and of course also of biomaterials. So, how can the oral surgeon de uh, determine intrasurgically a daily routine implantology? And now we come to the practical issue, because our research group, we are doctors in our own clinics, we are affiliated to universities, but our research we do from the practical point of view, because whatever we publish should have an impact on the daily work of possibly every surgeon on this planet. The protocols, if you once understood what are the main issues in successful implantology and bone augmentation, you will understand the protocols, but you don't have to learn them anymore. So, first of all, we are interested nowadays highly if immediate loading could be possible. So, once you insert an implant, you have to know somehow, can I load it immediately or not? And this, let's say at the beginning, um, you shouldn't do just by your own feeling. There should be certain values that you can apply to be, to a certain extent, sure 99% would be passed that immediate loading could work. Then, what could be the healing time for a two-stage implant? And what is the possible longevity of the implant? Because this is what the patients always ask us. But please always give them the right answer. The implant itself will last forever. The bone around the implant, that's the crucial question. How long will, it, will this last? <coughs> okay, the answer is very simple and now it's widely documented. The insertion torque value is even superior to ISQ values, RFK values, periodest, or bone density radiography. And this is not, let's say, our finding. There is a long list of publications recently published between 2009 and 2014 that prove beyond any doubt that for the clinician, the insertion torque value is the most important sign on the quality of the implant bed. I put it very carefully, and I don't speak about bone, because if we have bone in an augmentation site, pure bone, we only know if we take a histological specimen. If we feel something very hard, we see it is bleeding, maybe it will be still a compound of biomaterials or dead autologous bone and uh, new grown bone. So we speak about the implant socket, which has to give a high durability to the implant. 
So these are all the, uh, the publications recently published, very interesting reviews, multi-center studies with thousands of implants. But it is proven that the insertion torque value is one of the most important clinical parameters to determine the longevity of the implant and to determine if we can do immediate loading or not. So, to the material and method section, what did we do? Since we learned that there are differences with different biomaterials, we just took 109 consecutive patients with 157 possible sinus lift sites with subantral crest heights of 1 to 4 millimeters, which is, for most implant system, let's say the lowest limit for um, sinus augmentation and immediate implant insertion. I know there are a lot of surgeons that are able or that take the chances to insert implants also even if the subantral crest height is only two millimeters, but we always want to stay on the safe side. We're responsible to our patients and we don't want to be the big shots to say we can do all in one. If I don't trust the remaining sub, uh, subantral bone, I always decide to do a second stage surgery for implant insertion. Why take chances? So, the resulting study group was 107 patients and 155 sinus lift sites. So, the method we used was a development that we presented uh, the first time back in 2007 in Vienna. It was the so-called transcrestal hydrodynamic ultrasonic cavitational sinus lift, which is a very long word, so we speak just about the intralift, which is now widely documented by our publications. And I just now want to introduce you to the surgical technique. So the intralift works as this. First of all, it's a transcrestal procedure. That means we use the piezotome ultrasonic surgical device to do it. Because we developed this in cooperation with Actium Company in France. So instead of uh, doing a lateral procedure, uh, cutting a big window from the buccal side, we go transcrestal and with diamond coated tips that are highly safe and prevent a puncture or rupture of the sinus membrane, we do a pilot drill. And this pilot drill is then followed by the opening of the sinus floor, again with a diamond coated ultrasonic tip. And this is very, very important. With this, we just open the sinus floor. In the next step, we just prepare a receptacle, something like a ventile seat, like in a combustion engine, to receive the final detachment tip. So you can see here, this is the receptacle. It's about 0.2 millimeters smaller in diameter than the elevation tip. So the elevation tip now is plugged into the receptacle, and then just by pumping water between the bone and the Schneiderian membrane, we just elevate the sinus membrane to a standardized volume of 2.5 cubic centimeters, which is approximately a quarter to a fifth of the entire volume of the human sinus. Then in the next step, we just widen up the uh, transcrestal approach. Once again, with diamond coated tips, the more experienced one in this step use uh, drills because the membrane is already loose, so the chances to perforate are very slow. And then we just put in, push in the bone graft. And this was the basis for our, um, for our study, where at the end I will present the results. Because with this method, it was absolutely reproductible possible to insert bone graft materials and then find out how do the bone graft materials behave after nine months of healing. Because, of course, we did the insertion top value measurement exactly on the spot where we did the transcrestal approach. So that means exactly in this spot, it was possible to almost 100% measure the result of bone regeneration referring to the specific bone graft material without any bias of the surrounding natural bone of the patient. So this was the method of choice for our study. 
And I just give you once again in short words the step. First of all, you start with the minimal invasive crestal flap. Then you open the bony sinus floor. Then you prepare the receptacle. In the next step, you attach the elevation tip and you just detach the sinus membrane from the bony floor. Mm -hmm. <coughs> of course, we do this with ultrasonic instruments because the ultrasonic oscillations they enhance the detachment process and we were able to prove in a histological study that was uh, published uh, last year that we are able to detach the sinus membrane in its full integrity and this is very important because this you cannot see when you proceed clinically. It's a big difference for bone regeneration if you detach, detach the entire sinus membrane which is, and this is the most important part, the periosteum, this has to be detached. Or you just do a primary dissection of the sinus membrane and you detach only the fibrous strait of the sinus membrane and you keep the periosteum attached to the bone. Then you will have very, very little and very, very poor results in bone regeneration. And this you cannot see with the unaided eye and we, of course, had to prove that um, the intraleaf we develop uh, provides a full and clean detachment of the osteogenic layer of the sinus membrane, which was published in Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery in 2014. Um, you can just look up the article online. So, the next step was we had to choose the biomaterials we wanted to compare. So, why did we choose these materials? Very simple because I personally used BioOS for 10 years. I had good experience with it. It's not a bad material, it's a good material. But it's that cow bone, it's nothing special. I don't like the religions that are made out of products or funny stories around products. It's a good product, it's working because it's biocompatible. So, 1998, and the British participants here will remember this, we had the crazy cow disease. That means patients were asking, what are you going to use as bone graft in my sinus site, in my vertical augmentation whatsoever? And we told them, of course, it's that cow bone. So we had to discuss and discuss for hours and hours why they don't get the crazy cow disease back in 1998, where there was the big hype of the crazy cow disease. So we said, my time is the most valuable part in all the work, so there are other materials. So 1998, we then switched over to, sorry, we switched over to Nanobone, which is from a German company. Nanobone granules are uh, consisting of silica dioxide plus hydroxy appetite. It was working very, very nicely. And then, 2007, in a, at the symposium of the uh, German Implantology Association, I met uh, Dr. Kurt Rufieux <coughs> in Austria, and he introduced me to EasyGraph, which is petri calcium phosphate. But it is coated with polylactide, and when you add the activator, the biolinker, and the biolinker is rinsed out, it will get a hard home block. And this was fascinating me, because exactly at that time, we are in the middle of our development of the flapless crest split and of the superior tunnel technique with piezo dome. So of course we started to try this material. And of course we had nice results because it was another biomaterial that is biocompatible. Then in 2009, the great will issue the EasyGraph crystal, which is um, composed of 40% hydroxyapatite plus 60% hydroxyapatite, which gives, which gives, let's say, a non-resorbable part to the bone graft material and higher stability. And since we used this then very successful for some years, we found out that uh, the tendency of insertion torque values, once we insert implants in augmented site with easy graft, classic and easy graft crystal, they were higher compared with the values we got in the years back when we used nanobone and, um, and bios. So we simply started a randomized study. Um, every applicant 
for sinus lifting. And of course, since we are the inventors of the intralift system, uh, we only do intralifts anymore. <clears throat> I didn't do uh, lateral approach sinus lift now for more than uh, six years anymore because everything can be dealt with intralift. So we just took the intralift and then by randomization, we just um, gave every patient a different bone graft material. And of course, the doctor who did the intralift didn't know, uh, didn't know which uh, material was applied, but the other doctor then inserted the implant and took the, um, the insertion torque values. And to identify the spot where we have to re-enter for implant drill torque measure and uh, drill torque measurement, um, we marked the site with a medical ink. This is a clinical picture. This is the typical view on the intralift side. It's a very, very small flap. It's about six times six millimeters to eight times eight millimeters. This is now already filled with uh, bone graft material. And this is how it looks after wound closure. And this is minimal invasive. That means the less you detach vital structures from the uh, side where you want to have a optimum regeneration, the better the results will be by themselves, by biology. Okay, corresponding to this, you can see this is the case here. These were the post-surgical x-rays. This is the typical view on the intralift side. It always produces a half dome shape augmentation side. This is then the uh, final x-ray with the intralift, of course, and this is why we use it exclusively. Um, and why, in our opinion, it has the potential to replace any lateral approach sinus lift procedure because with one little three diameter hole transcrestal approach, you can fill the entire sinus floor. Okay, so another case, here you can see the opening and here you can see how the flap is reverted and then sutured and this is the typical site on an uh, the situation after an intralift. Of course, this patient has also a periodontal, a periodontitis problem here, but this was not the issue for the study. Okay, so <coughs> since we also made some experiments with intralift, which were published, I think, 2012, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. to place yeah, yeah, yeah. collagenous bone sponges under the sinus instead of bone graft material, and we got nice results. We also got the knowledge that after an approximate period of nine months, bone is fully reorganized. So this was our parameter to decide when do we um, measure our drill torque values and insertion torque values. So how did we do this? We reopened exactly where we took the uh, primary ingression for the transcrestal intralift. Uh, of course, it was marked with blue ink. And then, in the first step, we took the drill torque value in steps of one Newton centimeter. Mm -hmm. And in the second step, after we prepared uh, the implant side, we took the insertion torque values, also with an implant motor from the implant center to from satellite actio, which allows, a, a, um, which allows an adjustment of the drill torque value in one Newton centimeter steps. Otherwise, this study wouldn't have been possible. So this is a picture of the dashboard. Uh, this is the uh, form drill for the Q-implant system. And this is then the Q-implant system. So we took, of course, since uh, one member of our research group developed the Q-implant system, which is a German company which is uh, in Asia, it's, it's very well known, in Europe not that much, but it's just a tapered screw implant, which by itself, by its design, gives a very, very high primary implant stability. And of course, the results of the study I present today are valid for the Q-implant system. But it gives you a sign of tendency, what, how you can interpret it, the results. So to be once again fully unbiased, we took only one dimension of the Q implant. It was always four millimeter long, and tw uh, four millimeter wide, and 12 millimeter long to have comparable results in every subantral implant site. So this is 
once again to prove that also the Q implant system has a microporous rough surface, and this was the implant we chose for the study. So, I give you now a clinical example. This was uh, the situation after approximately 8.9 months. You can see the, oh, this is the um, pre-surgical situation. This is the post-surgical situation, a bilateral um, sinus lift. With so after 8.9 months, it looked like this. And then, of course, we opened. We identified the site with the blue marking. And then we inserted the implants. And of course, you see these were routine patients that received routine treatment. And of course, we took the drill torque measurement and the insertion torque measurement only on the sites where we did the primary intralift. All the other implants, we didn't do the measurement because it's very time consuming. This study, it took us about five to six minutes to determine the insertion, uh, the drill torque value and the insertion torque value. Okay, and these were the two implants where we did the measurements. So this was then the final result. This is the implant for drill torque values on the left side. This is the implant for drill torque values on the right side. And you can already see there are differences also in the radiographic structure of the bone graft materials. But I still don't know until the entire um, manuscript is published if this is, let's say, nanobone, and this might be easy graft, or this is bios, I still don't know it, because this will be only revealed once um, the work is published. Okay, then, as a control group, of course, we wanted to know what are the insertion torque values and the drill torque values in natural subantral bone. And once in a while, we are quite happy to have patients that have 12 or more millimeters of natural subantral bone. And this was the control group. So in this case, we took the drill torque values and the insertion torque values of implants placed on subantral, subantrally in natural bone. There are some cases to present here, here on this side and here on this side, just to know how natural subantral bone behaves concerning uh, insertion torque values. So, in the next step then, we come to the results. I don't want to bore you now with all the statistics, but I want to show you the graphics concerning the drill torque value. Here you can see the control group. We, with the control group, we achieved a drill torque value of about 10 to 15 newton centimeters, measured with the, uh, not with the pilot drill, but with the last form drill. In BIOS, we achieved a little bit, but significant higher uh, drill torque value, which was around 15 to 18 newton centimeters. In nanobone, we achieved another higher step of uh, insertion to value around average 20 newton centimeters. Then with EasyGraft Classic about 22 newton centimeters and with EasyGraft Crystal around 23 to 25 newton centimeters. Now you will say this has nothing to do with clinics because uh, first of all I don't have an implant motor that provides me an adjustment of the drill torque value in one newton centimeter steps. So we were a little bit disappointed, although statistically the differences in the drill torque values are highly significant, they have no validity for practical work. Because our idea was by determination of the drill torque value, we can already decide, do we take maybe a single stage implant for immediate loading, or do we take a two stage implant and respect a healing period also for the implant. So this was a little bit disappointing. Statistically, we found a difference, but for the clinical praxis, it has no validity for decision-making intrasurgically. This changed dramatically when we, took, uh, when we take a look at the results concerning the insertion torque value. Starting with the control group, we had an insertion torque value of about 27 Newton centimeters. 
we had a slightly better result with BIOS with 30 Newton centimeters, but then suddenly it jumped highly significant to insertion torque value close to 40 Newton centimeters with nanobone, and then another giant leap, statistically beyond any doubt, of about just below 50 Newton centimeters with Easy Graph Classic, and of course the highest values with Easy Graph Crystal and also with the least variance in the results. Okay, now we can say it's clear. I mean, this is natural bone. Maxillary <coughs> bone is very soft. BIOS is dead cow bone. It works, but of course, why should it give uh, a high resistance of the bone? But when we take now a look at the chemical composition of nanobone and compare it to Easygraph Classic, this is now very interesting because nanobone, as I told you before, is silica dioxide plus hydroxyapatite, which should give a very, very strong compound of regenerated bone and the bone graft material. Easy graft classic, on the other hand, is pure beta to calcium phosphate. That means after a certain period, it will be completely resorbed. Why is there so much difference between nanobone? and Easygraph Classic. And now I get back to the publication of Mamoto and of course you have to consider the fact that once you do sinus augmentation, uh, for you it seems to be a scaffold that is fully immobilized. But this is not true. Actually the sinus, the human sinus, is influenced by constant pressure changes. To fully immobilize an augmentation site in the human sinus would make the patient stop breathing or somehow to clog the entrance from the nasal cavity to the sinus cavity to prevent an air exchange and the pressure change. And when you once again take a look at the procedure that you detach the sinus membrane and then the sinus membrane is floating according to the pressure changes. And the pressure changes, it's just an information which, which uh, we receive from ENT doctors, is between 5 and 10 millibars, which seems to be very low, but actually that is very much, because it takes about 20 millibars to detach the sinus membrane from the sinus floor. So the constant breathing, especially in the very critical initial period of bone regeneration, when you have a compound of the bone graft material in case of bios and nanobone of loose particles in case of easy graft and easy graft crystal a bone block like compound soaked with blood and the initial blood clot and the initial um, um, soft callus that is organized by the body which takes approximately six weeks you have the constant influence of the pressure change. Now you would say, okay, 10 millibars are not that much. But once again, we were talking with the ENT doctors and they said, yeah, but listen to me. Every human being approximately sneezes once a day and then the pressure is extremely high. And I don't want to be disgusting, but just take an open look at your patients when they come in, take a look at, uh, Simple people that are going around the street, you see especially men going like this. <clears throat> what do you think, what pressure forces are we speaking about? We are not speaking about millibars anymore, we're speaking about bars. That means doing just one time like this, <clears throat> which is very disgusting, sorry for this, <laughs> creates a suction of one to two millibar, and this is quite much. And if you have to sneeze, Whatever you do with your nose has an influence on the augmentation side in the sinus. And so this might be, of course, until now we don't have the proof because we have to do further histological analysis in animal experiments. I hope we will be able to do this. But this could be an argument or this could be an explanation why we have such a big difference between particulate bone graft materials and self-hardening bone graft materials. Okay, so let's come to the discussion. 
Why does EasyGraph Classic achieve significant higher insertion torque values when compared to monoball? We were already discussing this. The possible answer could be, unfortunately for this we will need finally then the histological proof, because of EasyGraph Classic subcontrol state as immobile block enhances vascularization and mineralization against the constant pressure changes in the human sinus. We have to prove this still, but um, until now we have a significant difference and we will proceed now with the second series of clinical investigations. We are going to compare um, um, Kaitseos, which is uh, easy graft without the polylactide coating, which is also particulate material. We are going to compare easy um, Kaitseos Classic, Kaitseos Crystal, and Kaitseos Crystal mixed with APRF. And we want to see then, this will might take until uh, the beginning of next year, we want to see if we compare the same material, once immobilized and once mobile, if there are differences, and if the differences are significant. Until now, we have too little cases to just see a direction where it moves, but maybe in about two years there will be another biomaterial day, and then hopefully I will be able to present the results, because this then could be, on a clinical level, the proof that the breathing influences the bone remodeling after sinus lifting procedures. And once again, this is a very, very important uh, publication. It was published in Nature back in 2009 by Mamoto and Alia. Okay, next point in the discussion. How can the results of this study help the clinician to decide whether immediate loading or two-stage implant procedure is advisable for good long-term results? Very easy. I just have to take a look because I'm already still have time. Okay. Um, as I told you before, since the insertion torque values, oh sorry, the drill torque values gave a significant difference, but the differences were so small that with a common implant motor, you can't determine if it's 22, 23, 24, or 25 newton centimeter drill torque value. At that stage, you won't be able to decide, can I insert implants? single-stage implants for immediate loading, or should I insert two-stage implants and respect the healing period also for the implants to grow in or to be also integrated, immobilized? Because there is no difference between an immediate loaded implant and a two-stage implant when it comes to osseointegration. The only secret behind immediate loading is that the primary stability of the implant is so high that even if the patient uses the implant to transfer forces into the jawbone, the implant is still fully immobile and guarantees an osseointegration integration because although it is loaded, it stays fully immobilized. So, unfortunately, the uh, drill torque value could not be a reference to decide whether immediate loading is possible or not. But on the other hand, by the results of the drill of the insertion torque values, then of course you will be able to decide. The possible answer could be, since EasyGraph Crystal was the only biomaterial to achieve continuous and steady insertion torque values of more than 45 newton centimeters, the clinician could decide in favor of immediate loading when sinus lift was done with easy graft crystal. <clears throat> so, why do I speak now about 45 newton centimeters? Once again, this is, a, let's say, a discussion under progress. Um, I refer here to publications published by, Can by Canizaro at Aria and by Esposito. He was already mentioned today. Because it seems that when it comes to immediate loading, the magic line is around 45 newton centimeters. Once you achieve an insertion torque value of 45 newton centimeters, the long-term results of the implants compared to two-stage implants are the same. Of course, there are groups that discuss insertion torque values of 
35 uh, Newton centimeters to be reliable for immediate loading. There are certain groups also around Kanizawa et alia um, that discuss 80 Newton centimeters to be really reliable. But let's say when you take a cross look through the literature right now, we might say that if you have an insertion torque value of around 45 to 50 Newton centimeter, then you can do immediate loading and you don't have to fear that you may, might have a higher loss rate of the implants compared to two-stage implant insertion. So, in this case, the drill torque value might be your guide to decide during the surgical procedure of implant insertion if you can load the implant immediately or not. Because then you have to tell your patient, patient, look, we just achieved 20 Newton centimeters. It's better we make the implant also integrate unloaded for about three months. And then you will be happy, hopefully, for the rest of your life with the implant. Why take risks? Why take chances for just three months compared to the rest of the life? Because um, medicine should not be uh, mixed up with marketing. Of course, we are working in our offices, we have to attract patients, and there are a lot of funny stories going around in the, news, in, in the newspapers, uh, all on four, all on six, all on one. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put this, but really, it was about three weeks ago, it was on Facebook, all on one. One implant placed exactly in the midline of the mandible with a full arch bridge from 4.6 to 3.6. Ah, they didn't say how long it lasted, yeah? But I mean, you never know. There could be a funny company that says, okay, we can do all on one, yeah? But by, we have to respect biology and not marketing. And first of all, we are medical doctors and we have, uh, we have to follow ethical guidelines. And Personally, I don't want to take risks for my patients because um, it's nice to have a clear procedure to treat your patients, they are happy then, but it's not very nice when they come back then every two or three months and say, I have this problem, I have that problem, look, I'm losing an implant. Because let's say in some way we also have to give a guarantee on our implants. If they just start to drop out after two weeks or after two months or even after one year, um, well, I personally tell the patient, okay, let's do it again. I want you to make happy, but you don't have to pay. I mean, it's only fair. Because the mistake is mostly, as with any airplane accidents, it's a pilot error. And if I make a wrong decision, then it's my own fault. Okay, you on the intralift side, and to identify the uh, transcrestal approach to the sinus floor, you just have to look at this darker area. This is the place where we inserted, uh, where we did the transcrestal approach on this side and here on this side. So once um, during the study, we always insert exactly two cubic centimeters of bone grafts of underneath. Of course, by the differences, even in one single human, uh, both sinuses are, do never have the same geometry. Of course, we achieve different augmentation heights. So that means in this case, we achieved here approximately 11, meter, 11 millimeters, here also 11 millimeters, here 12 millimeters. But since the study protocol said, okay, it has to be two cubic centimeters, we had to use two cubic centimeters. So after a time period of six months, we normally do uh, CAT scans or CBCTs. You can see here the progression of the, of the uh, bone regeneration, um, nice and homogeneous. And then after nine months, this was <coughs> uh, the area of the front teeth uh, from K9 to the first incisor on the left and right side. And then we did the X-ray guided insertion of the Q2 implants after nine months. Um, of course, we marked the ingression for the implant here. This was the original site where we did the uh, transcrestal intralift. We did the pilot drilling, then the insertion of the implant. Unfortunately, the quality of the 
pictures with not the nice let me check if I can do this. <coughs> you tell me, is it better now? Or like this? It was better. Like this? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and of course, once again, we did the torque measurement only with one implant which was uh, the implant of the original uh, intralift side. So this is then the other side. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry because the x-rays on my computer look much better than here. But I hope you can just add the information um, with the optical nerve. So this is then the final result after the insertion of 6Q2 implants. Don't let yourself now be misguided that they are too close to each other because sometimes, and this is another sign why you shouldn't rely on x-rays because they just give you an oversight. Actually, you have, you have seen in the clinical situation that the uh, implants are pretty far away from each other. Anyway, after the insertion of the implants, then comes the final treatment phase, which starts with an extraction, first of all, of course, with the uh, reopening of the implants, the insertion of the abutments, then the extraction of the already very mobile front teeth. Here you can see the uh, Q implants treated with abutments. And then of course we inserted another two implants because to have uh, all on six is nice, to have all on eight is even nicer. Why is it nicer? Because Maybe, 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 once you will lose one implant. So since I attach full arch bridges all, always with provisional cement, I can always take them off. If I have a problem with one implant, I can decide, should I do periplantitis treatment or should I just remove it? But the, I remove the implant and I reinsert the bridge and the patient is happy and it doesn't have to endure pain and uh, additional cost. So we placed another two implants in the canine region. These are the two implants. Of course, <coughs> this was not for the study. This was just within the case. And this is then the final result. There are the two additional implants. Then they are treated with a provisional resin um, bridge for the time period of one week. And after one week, the situation looks like this. And then finally, the bridge is inserted. And of course, the patient is happy. And now comes the period where the patient is happy and I'm, let's say, sleeping not very good because um, you always have to keep in mind there was a reason why the patient lost the teeth. There was a reason. And my wife, she's sitting, uh, just sitting in front of me here in the front row, she is leading our periodontology department. She does so much training to the patients. She takes care about them every six weeks, every two months, cleaning, cleaning, instructing. She gives them a ultrasonic toothbrush, Philips Sonicare, not that cheap. Instructs them how to use it for hours. And sometimes, but this would be then the, uh, the issue of a, of a different uh, lecture, I can show you the long-term results because the patients mostly clean thoroughly in the first year because they had to pay very much money so if you have a new car you polish it every day after one year you say okay it's already used car let's just wash it every once a month and after three years or five years you say, come on I go once a year to the uh, to the car wash and, and that's okay. And this is the big problem. We can do wonders with bone grafting, with bone augmentation, with implantology. If the patient doesn't take care about the situation, the patient will end up exactly the same way like the patient ended up with his teeth. And this is then not our, well, actually it is our problem, but I, until now I didn't find a way to overcome this problem. In, except I know here in, in, in Basel, they just push out every patient that doesn't show up for, for uh, periimplantitis treatment or for 
um, um, implant hygiene every six weeks. So you're pushed out. But since we are doctors working in our offices, we cannot afford to just finish the treatment and then if we see the patient doesn't clean the work we did, we cannot push out the patients anymore because the patient will get, go directly to the lawyer and then we are once again in trouble. But anyway, um, this is then the final result in, the, in, uh, in this case with the bridge in sight. And this is then the follow-up after one year of prosthetics. You can see it still looks good. That means after one year, most of the patients still clean. Maybe we see each other in about two years again, and then maybe I will show you exactly the same case. I hope I can show you the case in a perfect state, but sometimes I have to uh, show you cases, the reality, how it could look even if my wife does a very, very th uh, thorough um, implant cleaning treatment. But right now the patient is happy and now we are following with the, with the lower jaw. Okay. So this is then the x-ray after one year. You can see very nice, stable um, uh, bone site. You have no resorptions and this is another issue. The more implants you place, the less uh, crestal bone resorptions you will have because um, your implantology is always a compromise between the available bone in height and in width and sometimes you will have uh, to take a narrow implant diameter which is about 3.5 millimeters and just by the uh, material titanium um, the titanium has a certain elasticity and if you overload the titanium you will have movements and these movements then create the vertical bone resorptions around the implants. It's not God made, it's just a biome biomechanical issue. Okay, this is then the case. Okay, I would say thank you for your attention and now let's open the discussion because I think there are a lot of things to discuss.